reporter for a Swiss broadcasting company. And uh, he will talk about good practices of direct democracy and democracy in general. Ronald, the stage is yours. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much, Anna, for this introduction and uh, hello to everybody. Uh, as you have said, I'm Bruno Kaufmann. I'm the global democracy correspondent for the Swiss Broadcasting Company. And uh, just making some adver advertisement, um, if you haven't seen it, I will also post it in the chat after my introduction that we just started an invitation to everybody in the world to share their best democracy stories to us. And uh, uh, probably and possibly uh, we will be able and I will be able to visit you and report about your story. So I will send this, uh, this information. I have a background uh, in Switzerland. I'm currently in Switzerland here at the Politforum Kefikturm in Bern, which is a very great institution for democracy support since 35 years. Um, the Swiss uh, uh, confederation first and now the city and the canton provide for a place where people can meet learn about democracy and also really use the space in the middle of the city uh, just a few meters from the federal palace to uh, make their events for free and uh, i'm also a swedish citizen since many years as i live in sweden and uh, have been a very active let's say uh, uh, observer, supporter, and also researcher on democracy. And that's a little bit my issue I want to share with you today, uh, talking about, um, about uh, democracy uh, in a way which um, uh, has to do with the, what, is, what is working, what is not working. And uh, I just uh, wanted to uh, know, uh, can you see my, my presentation? Yes, yes. Please. very good. Thank you very much. Um, the question uh, which I have been put uh, is about uh, what is democracy? What is direct democracy? What does it need to have democracy? Uh, how can direct democracy uh, be developed? And this is a very broad question, and I will uh, address these issues in my uh, presentation, starting with the issue of what is democracy. It's, of course, a very big question, and I will certainly not be able to, uh, to cover everything, but I want to give you a little bit of a, of a feeling about how this question can be answered. Um, uh, then, uh, maybe a little bit easier and something you are already um, uh, have experienced and discussed a lot in this uh, webinar and in these uh, meetings, what is direct democracy? Uh, thirdly, uh, what constitutes a democracy-friendly environment? Because, of course, democracy is not just about uh, active democracy going to the vote. I mean, here I have, for instance, just got the, the materials for the next referendum in Switzerland, uh, which I can vote on on the June 18. So I got my ballots, which I can vote in different laws. And then also the question about uh, what does it take to make direct democracy work? Of course, my colleagues, uh, Zoltan Pallinger and, and Sam Chang, will address the, these questions also specifically in, in certain contexts. I will be a more a little bit general. So what is democracy? I think we, we can just briefly try to, um, to answer this uh, with, a, with a shortcut by, for instance, thinking about what if democracy is a country? And in that way, uh, I, I'm, I'm simply thinking, a democracy, a good democracy is a country where everybody, independently if she or he is winning an election, uh, winning a vote, uh, really being able to, to contribute uh, decisively, if everybody, winners and losers, are happy. And you can even say a, a, a democratic country which works is a country of happy losers because you don't lose by not winning a vote, everything you have. You keep your uh, freedom, you keep your possibilities, you keep also your optimism about being able to influence. Uh, that's one way of thinking about democracy. Now, what uh, is if democracy is just simply a decision? And I think this is uh, very uh, clearly also about that uh, uh, having uh, uh, a democracy means in a way that democracy is basically a 
guarantee that it's not 100% sure that the minority wins over the majority or that the minority governs. In, a, in, a, in different ways of democracies, you have ways of, of voting, of deciding, of check and balances, which means, of course, not always the same majority or the same minority is there, but it's not like in non-democracies where for sure a minority is ruling over a majority, which can be very diverse, which can be very separated, but it's possible to change power. And transition of power is a very important thing that you accept the election, you accept the vote, and you can go forward. Now, thirdly, what is democracy? if it is a universal right, because it is a universal right. We have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, which will celebrate its 75th uh, birthday this December 10. And it's clearly indicating under Article 21.1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that everyone has the right to take part in the government of his or her country directly or through freely chosen representatives, which means that direct democracy is as much as indirect democracy part of this universal right. Now, finally, what is if democracy is Winston? Winston Churchill, he is famous for his uh, quote about democracy, which says, no one pretends that democracy is perfect or all wise. Indeed, it has been said that democracy is the worst form of government, except for all those other forms that have been tried from time to time. And I think it's a very important quote because it shows a lot about that de democracy is, of course, not the perfect way of governance. It will never be, but it's far less imperfect than all the other forms we know are out there. Now, I would say, in my view, democracy is in all kinds of forms, a form of self-government, which means that the individual, the minority, the group, the people as such have possibilities to govern themselves on different levels, with different tools, with different instruments, but it's not government by others. It's not government by foreign powers. It's not government by somebody. You have no opportunity and possibility to influence. So a modern democracy is always a form of self-government. Going into direct democracy, then, this uh, form of uh, possibility of directly exercising self-government, uh, it's, for me, are four uh, issues which have to be named, which are important for our discussion. Firstly, that direct democracy is not something different from what we would call a modern democracy, a modern representative democracy. It's still the same, under the same sun, under the same label of democracy, the same common denominators of democracy. It's like when you go to the uh, northern part of Scandinavia and somebody see the sun and, uh, and then she's a little bit uh, frustrated because she thinks the midnight sun, which she wants to see is a different sun from the sun, which is all the day there. It's just the same sun and direct democracy is under the same sun of democracy, but it's a specific part which you have discussed and we will discuss more. It's important to say that uh, democracy with direct democracy is more than a representative government, of course, because very often representative democracy is equalized with representative government, which would mean that you just give away your vote in elections every four or 50 years. I mean, we have just experienced, um, we have experienced that in Turkey recently, where people in a high number uh, were participating in two rounds, 85 to 90 percent in an election which was counted uh, properly in overall terms, but that's not democracy necessarily. That is representative government or even in the worst case, electoral autocracy, as we also could name Turkey as of. What direct democracy contributes to is uh, instead not undermining representative democracy, but to make representative democracy more representative because more voices, more influences, more views are included and the decisions are better representing the will of different kinds of people and the majority. And as a tools of, uh, tool, of course, agenda uh, in a direct democracy, it enables, it empowers people to be both agenda setters by being able to propose issues 
for instance, to a vote and being involved in decision making on issues. So both these factors also uh, shows that the direct the modern direct democracy is also covering the whole process. It's not just a voting day, it's every day. And I would say that the modern democracy with direct democracy means that every vote is counted on election day and is heard every day in between. This is, of course, a promise. And we, we know and we can see that democracy, the circumstances, the context for democracy have not been necessarily improved in the last 15 years. About 2008, when you go to different ranking institutions to measures, like this map is from Varieties Democracy, which is probably the best and the most comprehensive measure and research institute on democracy worldwide. You can see that the developments since 2008, which was something of a high level point, have been decreasing, which means that in 2008, about two thirds of the people in the world lived under some form of democracy. Today, it's only one third again. So we are back in a situation which reminds a lot about years before the end of the Cold War in the late 80s, 1988, 1989. After that, we could see a lot of countries introducing democratic forms, democratic governance, but this has been has been reversed. And this has a lot to do with that the promise of democracy and the environment and the preconditions for democracy are not matching each another in a way they should and they need to do. Because what we can see is that, I mean, for instance, the example of, of, the, of Tunisia shows us this very clearly is that there was this promise, this will for democracy very clearly, but at the same time, the promise of democracy to deliver not only freedoms and human rights, but also economic gains, uh, possibilities to expand a welfare state hasn't been uh, uh, really, uh, these promises couldn't be fulfilled. That, and now we see an autocratization is taking place. And this is in many countries around the world uh, taking place. And at the same time, of course, we see also a global fight from autocracies against democracies. So democracy is not just a promise which can be developed step by step, but also needs to be defended. And again, here the environment is very important, the infrastructure is important, and our knowledge about that, that just introdu inter introducing democracy or direct democracy is not enough. We have to develop and strengthen and support it all the time continuously, otherwise it will be weakened and overrun again. And it's also important in this way that the environment for for democracy needs to be covered in different ways by different uh, tools and, and rights and also principles. Uh, varieties of democracy, for instance, do these uh, rankings in a very comprehensive way by looking into 170 different uh, indexes and, 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 and variables uh, which are di divided in different parts and also cover the bigger picture of democracy, like the demo liberal democracy index, which has a lot to do with, for instance, the rule of law, the, the possibilities of, 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 of protecting democracy in different ways, check and balances, division of power, and the electoral democracy index, which is all about the possibilities for free and fair elections. Uh, the role of political parties, the right to be a candidate, the counting of the vote, administration of the vote. And we have also the egalitarian component of democracy, which is very important to measure, which has to do with inclusion. I mean, we have the famous example of my home country, Switzerland, which in an early stage in 1848 got uh, uh, you can say a liberal, uh, quite participatory constitution. Uh, but in the first 120 years, more than half of the people were excluded because the women couldn't vote, they didn't have political rights. So the egalitarian aspect of democracy, many democracies are totally uh, under, under uh, uh, delivering and excludes a lot of people, even young people, people which maybe have been in prisons. So inclusion has become a very important factor also for people who are migrating, all these aspects. And the participatory uh, um, component, of course, has then due to uh, much more about our tools. I mean, on this list, you see also interestingly, also how different countries are doing in different respects. And of course, we have finally also the deliberative 
component of democracy, which has, for instance, to do with the medium, with the freedom of, of press, the practice of uh, freedom of opinion, something which is often firstly and directly attacked by autocratic uh, leaders to not allow a critical, deliberative way to talk about democracy. I, I want to... Um, I want to uh, uh, finalize my input a little bit by going into the factors and aspects which have to do with the use and the practice of direct democracy under uh, and within representative and modern democracy. Uh, for this, uh, we have uh, from our institution, I'm involved in the Swiss Democracy Foundation, but also uh, our cooperations with other institutions and of course also Democracy International, where I'm a member of the board, developed the global passport to modern direct democracy. And I just want to uh, simply uh, conclude with a few principles. We can see that they are important uh, to look into why direct democracy in many countries doesn't work. For instance, the principle of to have and keep it simple, to have a, a legislation which in short terms with few limitations explain how to use it because direct democracy is an instrument by the people, for the people, through the people. And if you don't can understand it, if it's too complicated to use it, it will not be used, it will not work. We have so many tools of direct democracy around the world, more than 100 countries do that. Uh, which you can see on our direct democracy navigator, uh, but in maybe only one fifth of the country, these tools are really useful and are really, let's say, used in a way to strengthen democracy. Secondly, one of the, of the, of the key takeaways, takeouts from all this is also that we have to mind the thresholds because if you have too high levels of, let's say, signature gathering recommendations, then of course it will be very difficult for those the direct democracy ID is intended to, namely everybody and also smaller groups can use it because it's too hard to do it. So in countries where you have very high thresholds, it will seldom really work. You need time. Democracy is about having a dialogue, having a deliberation, having new ideas being tested. So that means that you need time and space to develop these ideas, to use these instruments. If you just have a few days, for instance, to gather 20% of signatures, the only ones who can do it are those who are already strong, those who have already power, not those who want to use their freedom and rights to be part of the governance structure. Uh, fourth important point is uh, this uh, very, let's say, problematic idea of that while in election, the votes are counted, those who are participating, making decisions. Very often, direct democracy, there is this strange idea that you need a turnout forum. That means that you need, for instance, 50% of the vote participating to make it valid. And uh, this is an inequality, which also creates a very strange uh, phenomenon, namely that not only the yes and no votes are counted, but also the non-votes, which means that if you want to propose something new and you want to win a law a vote or a constitutional vote, you have maybe, yes, 75% participating in a vote saying yes, but then you have 25% saying no. But if, for instance, half of the people don't participate, these non-voters are counted together with the no-voters, which of course undermine the whole idea of decision-making in a democracy. And this happens in many countries and also explains why direct democracy very often doesn't work. And uh, uh, I would say this is uh, also a point which we can see in many countries that you have the principles of direct democracy, you have the possibility and the right to propose issues, to vote on issues, but there is a little list which excludes probably the most interesting points people won't, would like to, to vote. If you, for instance, look into the Swiss practice and the votes and the issues which are voted most often of, these are issues which in other countries are especially on this list of excluded issues. Tax issues, international uh, uh, treaties are very often excluded which are issues which are of a very big importance for the people. And last but not least, I would say, again, what I said in the beginning, agenda setting and making decisions. And these decisions need to be binding because if you, are, for instance, have an election of a president and then the vote is counted, but then you say, 
yeah, it's nice. It's a recommendation. It's an advice, but we will keep the other one. Then it doesn't work. And that happens also, again, in many countries that votes are just advisory by law, which, of course, undermines the possibility to have a proper direct democracy. So all in all, I would say you need a good law. You need a, a law which considers all this, and then you have to stick to this law. You have really to be able to also appeal when it's not done. Only then you get a robust way of direct democracy, and you can always improve it, of course, but this has to be on a legal way. So my, 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 my key takeaways from all this is that firstly, democracy, it's an unfinished story and it will always be. We will never have the perfect democracy and that's good because we need our democracy to improve democracy and we need our democracy to defend democracy. It's an unfinished story. Secondly, direct democracy is exactly not uh, a counter uh, element of representative democracy. It's the best and the, the, the most proven way to make representative democracy truly representative because it allows more people, more voices to be included and to really have not a representative government only, but a representative democracy. Fourthly, uh, it's important and we should never forget that direct democracy, as it is defined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it's a universal human right. And that's something many often it's seen as an optional option in a democracy, but it's a fun, one of our key fundaments of a democracy that we can be involved even on issues. And finally, we have, when we are working on these issues, uh, we have to consider the whole hierarchy of, uh, of what it needs to have a strong democracy, a strong direct democracy. We need the principles, establishing a constitution. We need the procedures, for which you have laws, you have regulations, you have uh, orders. And finally, of course, the most important of all of that, we need practices. And for practices, we need to be active citizens. We need to be prepared for it. And we have to take responsibilities. And I'm very happy to see a growing number of people around the world like you taking this responsibility. I thank you very much. Bruno, thank you very much for your um inciting overview of the good and bad practices. It's a pity that you have to leave us so early, but again, thank you very much for joining us. And if you want to share any links, please do that in the chat. I will do that. I want to thank you. And I'm so happy to see so many good colleagues here uh, on, on stage, which uh, I'm absolutely confident about that they can continue this conversation with you. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. And for our lovely participants, I just want to remind you that you can always ask your questions in the chat. The second part of the webinar would be the uh, questions and answer sessions uh, where you would be able to raise your hand. But for now, if you have any questions, please text them in the chat. And uh, for our second part, we'll focus more on the case studies, so closer view on the practices of direct democracy and democracy in general in several countries. And our next speaker is uh, Zoltan Palinger, professor, head of uh, Danube Institute uh, at the Andrashi University of Budapest and chair of political theory and European democracy research. He will focus on the case of Hungary, its setback in democracy, and uh, the practices of direct democracy in the country. Please, Professor. Hello, uh, everybody. I'm very happy to share my thoughts on Hungary with you. I think it's a rather sad story, but nevertheless, I have prepared a presentation. I hope you are able to see it. Yes, perfect. So thank you. Uh, Hungary's political system is strongly characterized by the principle of representative democracy. The country has a long tradition of parliamentarism. It was only in the course of the change of the system in the 1980s, 1990s, that the instruments of direct democracy were created. In June 1989, the socialist regime tried to show up its eroding legitimacy by passing a law on the referendum and the popular initiative. 
This law had already come into force before the major constitutional revision of October 1989, which laid the foundations for democracy and also before the free elections in March uh, 1999. It can thus be said that in Hungary, direct democracy is older than democracy in the proper sense. Direct democracy does not correspond to Hungary's political traditions and therefore represents a kind of a foreign body in the political system. For this reason, the integration and adaption of direct democratic instruments into the representative democratic framework has caused problems since the introduction. So I will say something about uh, the state of democracy like an introduction uh, and the <clears throat> problems we are facing here in Hungary. Then I will go to direct democracy and also elaborate on some other innovative aspects like uh, preliminary elections and de uh, deliberative democracy. And then I will present my conclusions. Uh, if we look at the index, which Bruno has mentioned before, the WDEM index, and we look at the liberal democracy part in Hungary, so then we see uh, when Hungary uh, accessed the union, European Union, it was on the average level of democracy in that year. And since then, the quality of democracy in Hungary has steeply declined. Uh, this goes hand in hand with the accession of uh, Viktor Orban and the Fidesz party. Uh, if we want to characterize what has happened, then in Hungary, before we had a more or less two party system, now we have a dominant party system, the majoritarian elements of democracy have been uh, <clears throat> have become much more stronger. Checks and balances on the other side have been weakened. Uh, the governing party has a dominance in, uh, in the media realm. And also we can speak of crony capitalism that helps to create a uh, uh, a group of people who are sustaining a uh, government. So actually, we can pose the question, we have a majoritarian democracy with an absolute majority and limited maneuvering space for opposition. The institutions of representative democracy are under pressure. Also, the oppositional municipalities like Budapest, the capital, are under pressure. So one would think that there would be an incentive uh, for the opposition to experiment with participatory democracy. And why does this not happen on a bigger scale? So I will look at direct democracy in the proper sense, at elections and at deliberative democracy. First of all, I want to talk about the Hungarian conception of direct democracy. In Hungary, we have the principle of popular sovereignty, but popular sovereignty is exercised by the parliament. So direct democracy is only exceptional. The National Legislative Assembly has a monopoly on legislation. So if we put a question to a referendum, we never vote on a legal text, but on a political question. And it's only a political obligation on the parliament to enact an according law. But this also means if we have a successful referendum, the National Assembly is quasi in an executive function. So there is a limited interaction between the representative system and the popular system. And so the potential for deliberative democracy is very much limited. In Hungary, we have three instruments on the national level, which are called national referendum, 
we have a full scale popular initiative if you can uh, scratch together 200,000 signature the parliament has to call a vote so this is not controlled politically by the parliament there is uh, i would say a popular agenda initiative with a possible referendum if you can uh, collect between 100,000 and 199,999 signatures, then the parliament can put the issue on vote. So here is room for manipulation. So, for example, governing party can start a political campaign and collect signatures. And if they don't have enough signatures, the parliament can decide, uh, nevertheless, to put it on to vote. And there is a third instrument, uh, I would call it a plebiscite. Uh, the government can initiate uh, a referendum and the parliament has uh, <clears throat> to call in this case for a referendum. If we look at the practice of direct democracy in Hungary since democratization, between 1989 and two, uh, 2008, we had six national referendums with 12 questions. 10 were citizens initiated, three were invalid because of the participation threshold, and seven were valid. Uh, but mind it, citizen initiated, uh, it's a legal term. This does not mean that they were real citizen initiatives, but they were party initiatives. We also had one parliament initiated initiative. This was accessions to NATO and one constitutionally required, this was EU accession. So during democratization, we had these 12 questions and this functioned quite normally. Then between 2009 and today, we had only two national referendums with five questions. Uh, one was 2016, it was the anti-migrant uh, referendum. And the last one was last year, 2022, there were four questions concerning the right of uh, LGBTQ AI plus people or restricting them. Uh, those two referendums were not valid. They didn't pass the participation threshold, but nevertheless, they were an instrument for mobilization for the governmental party. The second referendum in 2022 uh, on these questions was on the same day as the national elections took place. So it was clear it was only a tools for uh, mobilization. All in all, we had 17 questions put to vote in Hungary since democratization, nine were valid, eight were invalid. Who were the successful initiators? It was the authorities, the parties, but not private citizens. There is also, I think, a very interesting phenomenon. We have the case of prevented referendums. Um, there are two cases, referendums which become obsolete or which are preempted. Take, for example, the 2009 referendum on the expenses of members of parliament. Some citizens wanted to control the expenses of uh, the members of parliament to curtail them because they thought it was too much. They collected the signatures, the parliament called for a referendum. They were of course not happy. And they legislated another law in which they renamed the MPs expenses. It got another name practically. And so uh, the subject matter was off the table and the referendum was called off. Or in 2016, the opposition found a good topic to attack the government. We had a Sunday a ban on Sunday sales, and the government saw that the, uh, the opposition would easily gather the signatures. So 
it took it off the table by uh, reintroducing the Sunday sale. So the opposition did not get a chance to mobilize. And we had also this on the level of Budapest when the Momentum Party was able to collect 200,000 uh, signatures, then the government withdraw uh, the proposition to hold Olympic Games in Hungary. Also, a very interesting thing is that between 2008 and 2016, we had no referendums at all. Nevertheless, 328 proposals were submitted. 15% of them were validated, but 313, 59% were rejected. There are numerous reasons for rejection, ambiguity, formal errors, etc. 79% of the initiators were private citizens, 16 were parties and also other organizations. So the National uh, Election Committee has the right to reject on formal grounds uh, referendum proposals, and they do so. And uh, they don't have a supportive manner versus the citizens. Uh, they reject it and you can hand it in again until you find a possibility to get your question through, but it's not user friendly. So what can we say about direct democracy in Hungary? It has conceptual flaws. Its significance is changing during democratization. It was quite important. Nowadays, it's much less important. And we also can see a colonialization of direct democracy. We have a political uh, gatekeeping by prevention and manipulation and a judicial gatekeeping by the National Electoral Committee. And we also have some uh, kind of substitution, so-called national consultations, which are information campaigns. So I would say at the moment, the potential of direct democracy in Hungary is very much limited. Now I want to talk about uh, other means of participatory democracy. If we look at the Hungarian election electoral system, we can see that it has very strong majoritarian elements. It distorts very much. If you look at the party votes, Fides and its ally has gathered 2010, it was 52%, 2014, it was 45%, 2018, it was 50%, and 2022, 54%. In this mixed electoral system that brought them a share in parliamentary seats of 68, 66, 67, and 68%. So what we can see, the Hungarian electoral system leads what we call in political center Duvages. No, if you have a strongly majoritarian system, this will lead to a two-party system. But actually, the, the problem for Hungary's opposition is it is very much divided. Even parties who are ideologically close are uh, divided. So they needed to find an instrument how to overcome this division. And in 2019, when we had the elections for Lord Mayor in Budapest, they tried uh, quasi uh, primary elections on the level of Budapest and they were successful. They regained Budapest from Fidesz party. So they tried this also on the national level in 2000. 21 for the elections of 2022. They elected the oppositional candidate and they also elected the uh, candidates in the single constituencies. Uh, these oppositional primaries uh, united the opposition. It was organized by a civil society group, AHANG. It was online and also in person. And it was organized in every electoral district. They chose one candidate. 
the prime minister candidate was chosen in two rounds. Meanwhile, the parties also were working on a governmental program. It was seen as a good possibility to overcome the division of the opposition. Uh, it was also seen as a transformational coalition, but the governing party seemed to be concerned, so it started an early dirty campaign. It was distributing electoral gifts. Then the war in Ukraine changed the whole narrative. And this overarching uh, oppositional coalition was not seen as trustworthy by the electorate. So it became a complete disaster for the opposition. So what other instruments do we have? Since 2010, uh, Fides is uh, doing uh, these national consultations. It says it wants to have a dialogue with citizens. And this was actually the national consultation uh, on George Soros, uh, the American uh, billionaire of Hungarian origins in the last 12 years, we had actually 12 uh, national consultations. These are not real consultations, but they are tools of a governmental propaganda, I would say. You have obvious questions like, uh, do you really want that Hungarian taxpayers money goes out for uh, illegal migrants or you want it for Hungarian families? So it's a tools, uh, it's an information campaign, and it helps the government to, uh, to create a narrative and dominate the public space. The municipalities, which are in the head of opposition like Budapest, they are trying something similar. Actually, now in these days in Budapest, we have a so-called residence assemblies and they ask us questions about what to do about the money the governments want to take away from us, what to do with public transport, uh, what to do with the chain bridge, etc. Municipalities in the hand of opposition like Budapest, they are trying to overcome passivity, creating trust and also they want to find a new kind of experimental governance. So they want to show that there are other alternative models of governance. We had 2020, the Budapest Climate Assembly, creating a climate strategy. We have uh, also participatory budgeting and the aforementioned Budapest Residence Assembly. But what we can see its uh, communicative impact is very much limited. So I come to my conclusion. A friend of mine, Laszlo Komaromi has said, participatory democracy in Hungary is out of practice due to lack of interest. So direct democracy and participatory democracy lost its significance, there are conceptual flows, there are manipulations from side of the ruling elite, we have the setting of the illiberal democracy and we have the prevalence of the representative system. There is a continuous pushback of substantial citizen involvement, but the political parties have also adapted and they try to colonialize direct democracy. So the potential for participatory and uh, direct democracy is very much limited. The only thing I see opposition is under pressure to innovate. They try, they failed up to date, but we hope that they can find new models. And also we can say that cities are the drivers and experimental grounds for participatory democracy. That was it from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, unfortunately, 
for our third speaker uh, must have the connection issues. Uh, so I think we'll proceed with the questions in the chat. Hopefully, Sam Chang, the Taiwanese and American activist who was supposed to speak about the Taiwanese usage of direct democracy, uh, will be able to join us a bit later. But for now, uh, let's proceed to questions. And the first one I see from the chat is from Ayan Denzong. I hope to pronounce it correctly, but my apologies if it's not the case. Uh, the question is, can democracy be perverted when advocates of direct democracy use it to revitalize governments who practice their own kind of democracy? Uh, Mr. Pollinger, would you like to answer that? Yeah, yeah of course, I think uh, we have to look at direct democracy in a systematic way. Uh, the more you use it, the better it becomes. Uh, so uh, if it's a completely exceptional tool, then people uh, uh, use it in an irresponsible manner. Think uh, of the Brexit referendum. And I think, uh, as Bruno has told before, direct democracy has to be integrated into the representative system. So there have to be feedback loops. And if you don't have these feedback lo loops, then people vote irresponsibly. But on the other side, uh, if you have these feedback loops, uh, there is a learning process. And this also means the, the representative system like parliament and the people should be brought together and discuss also uh, the initiative proposals, for example. I think that's a big problem in Hungary that, that there is no interaction between parliament and the initiators. And uh, perhaps this is a fun fact, uh, but I like this example. There is a book called The Xenophobe's Guide to the Swiss. And uh, it states, uh, if you can scratch together 100,000 signatures, everything can put be put on vote also uh, the proposal free beer for all and it's the wisdom of the swiss people that it hasn't happened yet i wouldn't say it's the wisdom but swiss people have learned on local level that if they vote for something like free beer for all then they have to pay taxes the state will make the redistribution in the end it costs you double price and you won't get the beer you like in Hungary, actually, there was this initiative. A gentleman put forward the initiative proposal. Uh, the drink called beer should be uh, distributed for free for all adult citizens. And uh, in Hungary, the problem was solved that the National Election Committee ruled uh, that the Hungarian constitution at that time said Hungary is... Uh, uh, market society. So it's not possible to do that. No discussion. I think they should have discussed it better because it didn't make no sense, uh, no sense to have such a thing. So a bit uh, longer than I thought. Thank you very much. And our third speaker is on. Uh, so I'm happy to present Mr. Chang, who is the founder of Negative Vote Association, an NGO in Taiwan that is dedicated to improvement of democracies by allowing voters to uh, have the option of vote against instead of for. And as I said earlier, Mr. Chang was, will speak about the case of um, Taiwanese usage of direct democracy. Um, do you want me to share your presentation? I'm sorry, you're muted right now. I can't hear you. No, uh, you are still muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Yes, would you please uh, share my presentation? Yes, absolutely. Can you see it now? Yes. Hi. Can you all hear me? Yes. 
Okay. Um, the next page is the outline. And what I will try to go through is a quick uh, overview of the background of the political situation in Taiwan, then the focus on direct democracy pre-2018. And uh, then there was a peak of uh, di direct democracy activity in 2018 then the decline afterwards. Um, and I will uh, uh, talk a little bit about some uh, local progresses, then address some of the obstacles and challenges. So on the next page, uh, the, uh, uh, what, uh, the, the situation in Taiwan in terms of politics, basically we can look at the rivalry between the blue faction and the green faction, blue being the uh, KMT party and the green being the DPP party, Democratic Progressive Party. Uh, this chart shows the presidential election results since 1996. That was the first year when a uh, president was elected uh, by popular vote. So we have had, uh, as you can see, seven elections and uh, for the last two elections, the DPP uh, have won with a overwhelming majority. Uh, what is interesting is also uh, occasionally there's a third party candidate, but uh, historically the third party candidate has never amounted to uh, much of the, um, uh, uh, never won a lot of the votes except uh, in 2000, in the year 2000, when basically it was a split from the blue forces uh, that uh, gathered uh, a lot of votes uh, in that particular year. So this rivalry basically is uh, very important as we address some of the direct democracy issues. Next page. So before 2018, uh, Taiwan had a uh, referendum act that was enacted in 2003, but it required very high thresholds, 50% participation of all electorates and approval of 50%. And uh, since it's in admin, uh, a total of six national cases were attempted and none passed the thresholds. Uh, so the uh, DPP, who, which was in opposition then, called direct democracy in Taiwan to be in the birdcage because of the, uh, the law basically prevents uh, any significant uh, use of this uh, uh, tool. But DPP came to power in 2016 with full control of all branches of the government, not just the executive, but also legislative. Uh, some people would even say they also control the judiciary, judiciary. So in 2017, some major revisions were passed. We go to the next page. These uh, were revisions that were passed in 2018. They lowered the voting age for uh, initiative referendum from age 20 to 18, lowered the thresholds of collecting signatures very significantly. Uh, in Taiwan, we have two stages of collecting signatures. Stage one uh, now requires only 2,000 signatures, and stage two now requires approximately uh, 300,000 signatures. So uh, these lowered thresholds allowed uh, real citizen initiatives to be advanced. In addition, the approval threshold was also lowered. Now approval needs to be higher than disapproval, of course, but it uh, needs to be higher than instead of 50%, 25% of eligible voters. So uh, also another significant change was that uh, initiative and referendum voting itself must be held 
on the same day as election day. And this is very important as uh, uh, most people know that uh, when you have election day, there's usually a higher participation rate. So if the INO, INR voting is held on the same day, there's a, a higher likelihood of uh, some referendum initiative getting approved. So uh, in addition to the above, the law also mandated that the central government must set up an online petition collection system and also allow absentee voting for INR. Unfortunately, at least two, even the law required it, uh, have not yet been implemented as of today. In 2018, 10 initiative renting, 10 cases basically were placed on the ballot in November, and seven were approved by voters and uh, three rejected. The results are basically seen by uh, all parties as a victory for direct democracy, except the results were all against the ruling party's wishes. So what does the ruling party do? Next page. Remember now that the Democratic Progressive Party, that's what the name of the party, was the one that uh, really pushed for direct democracy before uh, when they were not in power. Uh, but once they tasted, they realized that uh, uh, direct democracy can go against them when they are in power, they try to limit it. So in June 2019, they basically ran through the legislative UN, uh, very important revisions. The most important revision of which is to decouple the voting on the referendum from elections, but still maintain the approval threshold so as a result of the revision, um, the uh, one proposal that had already qualified uh, was postponed uh, to another day to, to be voted. And the pandemic postponed it further to December 2021. And on that day, December, uh, 18 of 2021, there were four national cases, none passed. And because voter participation was only 41%, in spite of very heavy mobilization by both the blue and green parties, this is compared to a normal uh, presidential election day, uh, usually participation will be as high as 67%. So with only 41% voter participation with heavy mobilization, in order to pass the approval threshold, you basically needed something like 65% uh, approval uh, to, to, to get something passed. So the next voting day for INR in Taiwan will be August 26th of this year. Uh, we basically accept zero case uh, to, to qualify. So KMP, which is now in the opposition, opposition called direct democracy in Taiwan, not being a bird cage, but in an iron cage. Next page. In spite of these uh, national uh, sort of uh, ups and downs, we have some small cases of victories in local um, uh, referendum uh, efforts. For example, even during the low, uh, really, uh, uh, so we, we call them the bad law years, uh, the, the birdcage law years, there were uh, very, uh, th there were referendum for uh, all related to gambling issues in these very small islands. Kinmen, Machu, and Penghu, which are offshore from Taiwan with very, very small populations. And uh, these were decided by voters. Uh, three were rejected to set up casinos. One in Machu was approved, but 
it was never implemented anyway for other administration issues. Then next page, uh, within the Taiwan island itself, in December 2021, Xinzhu City uh, uh, voters approved a clean water referendum with 85% approval on 43% voter participation. This is in spite of um, uh, DPP's ruling party opposition at the national and local government level. Uh, this is approval was due to a lot of efforts by the citizen group over uh, a long period of time. Uh, I remember when uh, Bruno and I visited the leader of this particular group, she uh, basically told us they were having a uh, conversation with Shinto city citizens uh, virtually every day of the week uh, to, to talk to them uh, about the issue. So in uh, and the other important progress at the local level is that uh, although the national government uh, has um, basically uh, 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 sort of dragged its feet uh, regarding the online petition collection system that the law required it to do, Taipei City implement a, such a system uh, just in August last year. And uh, uh, so that's some small progress that we we uh, we like to see more of that in Taiwan. Uh, another setback at the local level, however, is an example in Keelong City, a harbor city, a uh, population of only 360,000. Uh, there's a local initiative trying to block a uh, LNG terminal proposal. Uh, this is supported by the central government. So the central government essentially blocked this initiative from going forward. Next page. So I would discuss a little bit about what I see as the uh, challenges, uh, the issues that uh, uh, we need to improve upon. Uh, I remember Bruno mentioned that in some countries, the uh, uh, the law itself makes a referendum just as an advisory. Uh, that is somewhat true in Taiwan. Uh, the uh, if a referendum is approved by voters, it will still need to go through the legislative yuan uh, to uh, actually write out the laws, and uh, there. And in that process, uh, the legislation is sometimes uh, accused of uh, tweaking it so that it actually doesn't exactly follow the wishes of the people. And, um, and there's no way to penalize anyone when they do that. And the political rivalry uh, between the blue parties and the green parties means that uh, it could be a uh, opportunity and could be a challenge. If the dominant forces, uh, which is tend to be the, the ones in power, uh, they don't they don't like to share power. So they when they are in power, they don't want to encourage direct democracy. That means the opposition also change. Uh, opposition becomes more uh, supportive of direct democracy. And it is, I believe is for that reason, uh, Taipei City was able to get its legislator approve an online uh, petition collection system. So we hope more of these uh, online petition systems will be set up at the local level, uh, although the central government is uh, against it, apparently. And uh, uh, because I had a personal effort in trying to 
uh, get the Taipei city to implement this. So I believe that uh, continued activism uh, will be very helpful to advance direct democracy in Taiwan. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And after such an insightful input, we can go back to the questions. So the next one in chat was from uh, Wolfgang Pappe. Uh, how can you avoid the self-destructive results of digital crowd voting by clicks? Um, maybe Sam, if you want to answer that. Sorry, repeat the question again. Uh, how can you avoid the self-destructive results of digital crowd voting by clicks? Okay, digital, well, uh, I'm not sure uh, we can totally uh, avoid that, but we, um, let me give you an example of how uh, we try to collect signatures digitally. Um, the the requirement in uh, Taiwan uh, is that the when you collect signatures, you need to provide a lot of personal information, uh, such as a personal ID number, your home address, and so forth. So people are very uh, reluctant to share that sort of information, and. Uh, uh, so we designed our system of collecting uh, signatures online to make sure that these information are provided because government requires it. But we also try to assure people will have um, confidence that uh, this data will not be hacked. Uh, so because people are providing so much information of their personal information, it, I believe it's difficult to have a, um, uh, a, a, uh, a difficult for people to abuse the system by having too many people on it. We, I, I don't see how they, uh, they can do that. I don't know if that addresses the, uh, the question. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Christoph Roland and it's directed to Bruno Kaufmann. Unfortunately, Bruno had to leave us right after his speech, but maybe some of our expert or my colleague Caroline from Ivan would like to answer that. So the question is, how do you consider the possibility to encourage global citizens to vote for a world federal system? In my experience, I learned that even on national level, there is only a minority of democratic countries voting. I guess the percentage will be even worse if national people vote for global democracy. Yeah, I, I can take that. Um, yeah, so I think, okay, so I think first of all, we need to differentiate there when we talk about the world federal system, I think you are talking about something like a world parliament. Um, and I think we can we can go back to um, to what Bruno said in the beginning, like direct democracy, democracy in itself, it's not one, it's never one instrument, it's a, it's a, um, it's an entirety of society, right? So we need every um, we need there to be robust institutions. We need there to be a uh, possibility for debate. We need there to be uh, good uh, free press. We need people to not fear for their safety when they vote. We need to be able to ensure safe elections. Um, so all of those things are obviously very difficult on the global level. Um, so voting for binding things on the global level um, in a world where, if you remember Bruno's map, uh, where only one third of countries can really be considered democracies right now, is maybe not um, not an ideal um, situation. Um, however, there are initiatives and, and Democracy International uh, has an initiative for more democracy on the global level. Um, it's called We the Peoples for a more inclusive and democratic United Nations, because we consider that the UN is the closest thing we have right to a world government obviously they don't uh, make binding decisions and they are very dependent on on nation states um to to make decisions and to implement decisions and and even um, to fund the work that they do um nevertheless they do important work um there's a there's a very interesting study that came out in uh, 2020 
uh, that shows that I think it was 97% of the of people and they, they questioned uh, one, one and a half million people around the world. In every country in the world, they spoke to people. And 97% of those people said that they think that the UN is important and does good work. So it is maybe one of the highest approval ratings that any sort of institution um, can, um, can hope for these days. Um, but it is also an institution that was built in a world it's it's um it's almost 80 years old um it came out of a out of a conflict and our the main question when we set up the un was how can we stop countries from fighting each other um and so it's it's very um indirect it's, it has lots of safeguards built in um and so in the best case scenario you've vote you live in if you live in a democratic country that's the best case scenario you vote for a parliament that parliament appoints a government and that government uh, has a foreign minister who appoints somebody who will speak for your country at the un so there is absolutely a uh, very little way to hold those people accountable um that doesn't mean that we can't make it more democratic um we have for example we have a very good example in the european union which was set up in very similar circumstances in a very similar time um, basically to stop France and Germany from going to war with each other and dragging the rest of the world with them, right? Um, and um, in the beginning, it was a very um, indirect institution. It was a very narrow institution, and it's gradually over time become more democratic, also because the citizens in Europe want it. Um, and so now there is a directly elected parliament. So I am from Belgium, and I get to vote who represents me uh, at the European Union in the EU parliament. Um, so from Belgium and from which party. So it's never just one person, it's multiple people, depending on how many people live in your country. Um, and the European Union even has a direct democracy tool, which, which has existed now for almost uh, for 12 years, I think, or for 11 years, um, and uh, which is not binding. So it's very different to, um, to the tools that, um, that Professor Palinger and, and Sam Chang have talked about. Um, it's an agenda setting tool. It means that you can collect signatures. Um, so if I disagree with something that the European Union is doing, or I think they should be doing something that they don't do, I can. I need to convince enough other people that that is a good idea. Uh, and the way you do that is by collecting signatures. And in Europe, that is 1 million signatures in at least seven member states. It's a very high threshold. Um, which nevertheless has been reached uh, by, I think, over 100 initiatives by now in this in these 10 years. So that's about 10 a year, which is, and it's, it's getting used more and more. Um, and when you manage to get to reach that threshold, then the European Commission um, commits itself to, to formulating an answer. And that answer may be, we think this is a great idea. We're going to implement all of it directly. Um, this has happened, as far as I know, once, and then there's a couple of um, initiatives where, where they, they did some of the things and they didn't do other things. Um, or they say, um, this is something that we will look into, this needs more debate, um, and so on. Um, in recent years, uh, there's been some reforms as well. The, the European Citizens Initiative, like the Citizens Initiative in Taiwan, is not... Uh, stable, like democracy is never finished, right? So we're constantly changing it and, and innovating it. Um, and so now it's also the case that um, initiators can present their case to the European Parliament, which may then still decide to enact laws in the European Union, and they are binding in the European Union. Um, so, so there are some precedents that show that this is possible and that people actually use it in a very conscientious way. Um, and 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 um, that in a functioning democracy with the right checks and balances in place, this can work. And there, I, in my opinion, there is no reason that uh, an agenda setting initiative like this could also work at the UN level, where you could propose something to the to the UN General Assembly, which is sort of the parliament, right, the parliament of the UN or the world parliament, um, with the exception, of course, that the General Assembly never makes binding decisions. Um, so this is just infrastructure that is that is lacking right now on the global level. Um, maybe a small side note on on the, the the topic of minorities voting. So the like we've talked about turnout quorums, like right. Um, if enough that a certain amount of people have to show up for a vote to be binding. Um, not everybody is interested in every topic. Um, in Switzerland, they vote four times a year on, on several things. And sometimes it's questions as, um, as strange, let's say, as should farmers be allowed to cut the horns of their cows or not? 
um, which I thought, which which is one of my favorite Swiss referendums yeah, referendum right. questions ever, um, because I. I don't personally have an opinion on it. So I, on that day, do not have to go vote. But there are people who feel very strongly about it. And I am very happy to, on that day, let them decide what they think is best. So um, we do not always need a full. It's not because not 50% of the people have turned out to vote and said, yes, we want this, that not everybody agrees. Um, and as Sam explained, the, the situation in Taiwan with the with the law before was that the, the turnout quorum was so high that actually none of the referendums passed. And then what happens is that um, instead of opponents of an initiative, instead of mobilizing people to come vote no, they mobilize people to stay home, which is much easier. It's much easier to come to encourage people to stay home and not to participate in democracy. And I think that is something that that, you know, we should never be in favor of. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is already answered, but still uh, I want, uh, if it's possible, Professor Pallinger to yeah, voice out loud the answer. So the question is by Itzel Riba, and it goes like this. Does the National Election Electoral Commission in Hungary depend directly from the government or can it work as a counterbalance between the government and the citizens? Legally speaking, it is independent, but, but its members are delegated by parliament. And so if you have a two thirds majority, you can delegate the people you want. So it's like court packing. So in principle, uh, it would be uh, independent, but in reality, it's dependent. And so it also cannot work as a, like a counterbalance uh between government and people actually when the new uh hungarian constitution was drafted a uh, colleague and i we proposed that uh, this election committee should provide the ballot pamphlet uh, and provide uh, objective information because in hungary there is no objective information on the ballot uh, the state doesn't provide it and the parties, they just uh, campaign. But uh, this was, of course, rejected. So I think in the present form, it works as a strong instrument of gatekeeping. Okay, thank you very much. And if anyone from the participants also still has a question, you can either send it to the chat or... Um, <laughs> Raise your hand, but for now, I don't see any questions coming. Uh, oh, I think I see one. It's from Eric. And do you consider the EU as a democracy? I, I think that's that's a question for me because I said it. Um, <laughs> Of course, the EU is a democracy. It is not a perfect democracy. I will agree with you there. Um, but we do all vote on a parliament. We can be sure that those that those votes are um, that they take place in a in a good manner. That the camp there are, there are rules about how campaigning is supposed to be done. Uh, the voting is done in a fair and and a transparent way. We are also sure that the people we elect will represent us. Um, we have uh, a. A commission that 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 does you know that that function like in the European Commission, which is the equivalent of a, of a of a government which functions, which has um which has rules, and and we have uh we have a court system in the European Union. We have the the European Court of uh the European Court of Justice. We have we have free and fair press in most of the European Union uh, that that can monitor um how how politics take place in the EU. Um, we do not have enough attention, I think, in my opinion, to what happens at the EU level in the press, but that is not something that we can blame the EU for. Um, and so there are, of course, any democracy is always in progress, um, but, and, and anything can be made better. Uh, for sure, the EU has also had their share of scandals. For sure, the, the system has has its flaws and, and it's very indirect and, and it's, it's sometimes very far from the people, but, I think there can be no question. Um, there can be no question that the EU is a democracy and that it 
um, that it also works on, on perfecting that democracy. It is, it is really an institution that also thinks about how that is aware of their democratic deficit, that thinks about how can we involve citizens more closely and that in introduces tools to do that, such as the European Citizens Initiative, such as, such as the Conference on the Future of Europe, which was a process which involved randomly selected citizens from all over Europe, asking them from the, from, for their opinion. Um, so, so I think there can absolutely be no question as towards, as towards it, if the EU is a, a, a democracy or not. It's not a perfect one, but it, but it is a democracy. It seems to be a heated topic because we have another question, which is if the EU is not a perfect democracy, do you think China, Russia, Venezuela have their own imperfect democracy? Mm -hmm. Well, I mentioned a lot of things that we have in the EU, free and fair election, a free press, a functioning opposition, um, no fear of retribution when you go vote for a party or for a candidate that uh, is not in power. I think for the examples you're, uh, you're mentioning there, they do not have any or most of those um, elements in place. And so, yes, then, uh, then we do not... I don't, in my opinion, yes, we cannot speak about democracies. And that is not just my opinion. There are many institutions and many academics. We have one here <laughs> um, who, who do lots of research in this and, and who have um, very clear sort of set of elements of what it means to be a democracy and, and what doesn't mean to be a, a democracy. And we can argue about which institutions make a democracy. Um, but what we absolutely cannot argue about is that a democracy means that the people decide for themselves. Um, and in the countries you have mentioned, China, Russia, and Venezuela, I think if you would ask people there, most of them would agree that they have very little influence on the policy that's being made in their name, even if they do have nominally elections um, and a parliament um, and a government. And um, yeah, anybody feel free to, to compliment me there because I... I'm not the, <laughs> the final say on this. Yes, if anyone wants to add something on that. Um, but um, if no, I think it's time for us to wrap up, unfortunately. It's already been an hour and a half. And thank yeah. you for uh, such valuable uh, informational inputs, our experts. And thank you, our participants, for being so active. Um, this webinar concludes the series of spring semester webinars, um, Direct Democracy Simplified. And I encourage you to stay in touch with Democracy International, subscribe to our newsletter, social media, uh, because hopefully soon you will hear about more of our events and news about direct democracy. Hopefully see you soon. And thank you very much for participating. Goodbye. All the best. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you very much.